Uh, now I'm going to be uh, interviewing uh, Mr. Andrews. Uh, the first time I met uh, MSF was in, um, in Boston. We both spoke at the same event at the uh, Atheist Alliance uh, convention there. And, and uh, the day, I'll never forget the day I met him. I was, you know, was in the general area where I was signing books and um, uh, you know, speaking to people who had, who had read some of my work and uh, may have even signed a boob, I think, from memory. <laughs> and, and I was loving it. Who doesn't love that kind of attention? The next minute... <laughs> Next minute, this guy walks in, and all the attention in the room is just fixated on him. At that point, I hated this guy. <laughs> but I've gotten to know him. He has one of the most uh, sexy voices I've ever heard on radio. And I'm going to be honest, even though I have a 41-year or 41-year staunch record of heterosexuality, <laughs> He has uh, certainly made me question. <laughs> Just put all your keys in the big bowl at the back and we'll get this party started. But uh, his book uh, is one of the best polemics on, you know, the, uh, the process from stepping from superstition into reason. It's a personal journey because it's a journey that he took himself. Um, I encourage everyone to read it. It's, it really is a fantastic read. Uh, he has the number one atheist blogcast in the United States with a ridiculous amount of listeners. I think, I think more people listen to your show than went to watch the movie Noah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, I welcome the great man. And uh, here he is, Seth Andrews. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out today. It means a tremendous amount that on a day this gorgeous, you would be here, <laughs> inside, in the dark. Before I officially begin, funny story. Today is, is I'm not looking for applause, so don't give it. Uh, today's my birthday. And so we're in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, okay. It, it ain't the years, it's the mileage, right? So. Natalie said, what do you want for your birthday? Well, I'm one of those guys, normally, if I, if I need something, I just go get it. I don't, I don't need a lot. But I'm working on an idea for a second book that may or may not come to fruition. And I told her, I said, I'd, I'd like to go and sit down for a reading with a psychic just to see what happens. And so yesterday at Ocean Beach... <laughs> which apparently was ported in from outside this solar system, <laughs> we found a psychic. And I went in and we all sat down. There were several people there, most of them related. And she began to ask me questions. And there was a series of cards and there was several rows. And at the top, she said, this is God. And God has an amazing message for you. And the card, was, it said Druid on it. So I looked up at her and I said, so is God, the, uh, is God a Celtic priest or does he speak to the Celtic priest or is this, is this part of the ritual of Samhain or, so I started to ask specific questions. And she cocked her head like a cocker Spanish. She goes, oh, right? <laughs> well, it's, it means different things to different people. She said, you've got to go with it. You, this works if you believe in it. And I said, but in order for me to believe in it, it has to work. <laughs> and she said, I have a question. Do you, uh, can I ask you about your belief system? Do you believe in a higher power? And I said, no, I don't. And she took the God card, the Druid card, and goes, Whoosh. Oh, you know what? Never mind that. <laughs> no, let, never mind that. Bizarre. We'll see if it translates into something in written form. How many of your podcast listeners? Thank you so much. 
How many of you are products of religious homes, families, or cultures? How many of you come from religion? Woo. It's like a self-help meeting then today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Seth, ex-Christian. I've been sober for six and a half years. <laughs> I have a confession, you know, the Thinking Atheist website, I'm not the Thinking Atheist. The Thinking Atheist is an idea, it's an icon. You and I who come from the faith know what it's like to walk up to a pastor or spiritual leader and say, this doesn't make sense, can you explain it to me? And they look at you and they say, you're thinking too much. Yeah. You can't put God in a box. There's no way you, the insect, can understand the mind of God. You have to turn your brain off and go with it. You have to take it on faith. And I, I thought, no, I'm done taking it on faith. Let's create an environment where thinking is encouraged. And so that's what that icon represents. But lately, I must admit to you that this has been my posture. <laughs> good. Because I feel like I am having the same conversations over and over and over again. Those of you who are in the arena of debate, do you know how that feels? Yes. Science gives us something new to talk about every single day. Religion, we've been debunking the same stuff over and over, and yet it continues to be tossed at it as if it was a fresh and new idea. Now, I'm the next radio guy. In fact, I was in Christian radio for about a dozen years, and I went into pop and rock radio after that, and I know what it's like. When radio plays a song, and the first time you hear it, you go, man, that's really interesting. And then after corporate radio is done with it, and they play it every nine minutes for three months, what happens? The song comes on the radio, and you are out of there. Know what that's like? That's why right now I would like to have a moment of catharsis with you, a moment of therapy as we review some of my top theist arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, on the countdown tonight, we start with Ken Ham. My granddaddy wasn't no monkey. <laughs> you guys see him and Bill Nye? I thought Bill did great. There were a few times I was shouting at the television, probably like you were, say this, Bill. My... <laughs> Sorry, he's Australian. We don't count him. We don't count him in any statistic, normally. It was amazing, uh, the question at the end, when they said, what would it take for you to reevaluate your position? And Bill Nye was like, one piece of evidence. Ken Ham was like, hi, 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 I don't know. He just shut down. Anyway, I, I thought Bill did very well. Next on the list, evolution, it's just a theory. Anybody heard that one? The God of the gaps. It takes more faith to be an atheist. <laughs> Teach the controversy. This is for Wendy Wright and her ilk. You were never a true Christian to begin with. You took it out of context. I had a personal experience. You were just angry. Better safe than sorry, Pascal's wager. There's a little blaze for you right there. Hey, how did something come from nothing? The eye is too complex to have evolved. Scientist X believes in God. Here's a copy of his book. I suggest you read it. It's true because the Bible tells me so. All belief systems deserve respect. America was founded as a Christian nation. Hey, they found Noah's Ark again. <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes. Hey, if it's not true, how come it's been around for thousands and thousands of years? Ignore the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. Where do you get your morals from? With a special bonus track, Hitler. <laughs> Do people throw the Hitler grenade on the West Coast as much as they do in the Midwest and the Southwest? Five minutes into a debate, Hitler, it's like a reflex. You've killed God because you want to replace and be God yourselves. It's not religion, it's a relationship. Charles Darwin had a deathbed conversion. He accepted Jesus. 
in his final moments. I had an NDE, a near-death experience. I floated out of my body. I floated over the operating table as I was lying there, and I saw myself, and I heard what the doctors were saying, and I know what the music was in the room, and then I came back into my body and reported all of the details. It's a miracle. Bullshit. <laughs> There are no transitional fossils. Prove he doesn't exist. Why are you stealing my joy? <laughs> For someone who doesn't believe in God, you sure talk about him an awful lot. I think you've got a guilty conscience. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you in a way. And help me out with this one. You may not believe in him, but he... You guys should go on the radio and count it down with me. You're really good at this. For many, this is legitimate in its response to science. To you and I, it is what we call a weapons-grade facepalm. I was fitted at a very early age with God glasses. God glasses do two things. They filter out uncomfortable incoming rays of light. The things that make you squint and go, oh, that makes me uncomfortable, blocks those out. The second thing it does is it comes with blinders, which keeps your vision focused, actually forward and up, so you don't see much of what's going on around you. I'm a product of a hugely Christian family. My parents are theologian-level believers. I'll tell you how intense they are. They met at Oral Roberts University. <laughs> the Disney World of woo, folks. They honeymooned in the Holy Lands. Uh, my mother wrote a Greek New Testament study guide used at the college level. And the idea that I would be here today speaking out against that faith is a moment of tremendous heartbreak for them. It gives me no joy. But I honestly, I feel like someone has to say it. It, it helps me to say it. That what I was given was sort of a spoon-fed worldview and I was fitted with God glasses. I wasn't really seeing I was seeing a limited perspective, but not the whole thing, not by a long shot. Anybody know what this is? It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Are there any Douglas Adams fans? The rest of you, shame on you. No, if you ever get a chance to read some Adams, he's, his stuff's amazing. Of course, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. As they build the computer deep thought to give us the answer to life, the universe, and everything. We're always searching for answers. We want to know. The computer takes, what was it, 7 million years to come up with the answer, which was 42. Hugely anticlimactic and unsatisfying. So then they switch and say, well, maybe we need to understand the question. What is, what is the ultimate question? I will come back to that. It's so frustrating to live in a culture that doesn't just abide ignorance. It celebrates ignorance. Anyone ever heard the, you know what, I don't, I don't want to know. I don't need to know. I don't, I'm not interested. You know what? It doesn't matter what evidence you bring. I'll never change my position. What a prison that is. I was like this young lady. Now, does she have any idea what's in that book? Does she have the experience, the perspective, or maturity to properly digest what is read to her from that book? No. no. But if you were to take her aside in full view of her mother and father and say, is that book true? What would the answer be? Yes. And her parents would be beaming with pride. Oh, how wonderful. Who loves you more than anyone? Jesus. Even your own earthly mother and father. Who loves you more? Jesus. It's tragic. I did a, in fact, the speech I did in Boston was called Get Them While They're Young. It talks about the hyper-targeting of young people. That speech is online. And this mindset comes from the pages of Scripture. Colossians says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. In 2 Corinthians, we look not to the things that are seen. We look to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, well, those are eternal. What happens out here, this is unimportant. It's only God, it's only the Bible. It's only God, it's only the Bible. In fact, if you go to Creation Ministries' website, they'll just tell you. By definition, no apparent perceived or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. 
Does this terrify anybody else? Science could bring us a life-changing discovery tonight. Would change the world. But if it doesn't fit between the first and last verses of the Bible, you kick it to the curb and reject it outright. How tragic is that? I'm reminded of this cartoon with the candle of science, and they say, hit it with your Bible. <laughs> Now, here's one of the best examples of this kind of training, and it is training. They go after young people specifically to limit them to fit them with God glasses. Anybody here know who Joyce Meyer is? Well, for those who may not, she is an evangelist. She's an author and speaker. We actually featured her in our Sex, Money, and the Ministry uh, broadcast as we talked about the multimillionaire evangelist who live hugely luxurious obscenely luxurious lives uh, in the name of God. Uh, we did a story about Joyce Meyer. She put a $30,000 toilet in one of her mansions. And you think about the offering plate being passed and the book sales, and you think about all the truly needy people in this world, and you think, is this truly God's will? Well, she wrote a book called Battlefield of the Mind for Teens. It's targeted to teenagers and the parents of teenagers, how to be a godly young person, how to raise a godly young person. And she said this in her book, and I quote, Satan will look for your child's weakest area and attack at that point. He will attempt to fill your child with worry, reasoning, <laughs> fear, depression, and discouraging negative thoughts. She lumped reasoning in with worry, fear, depression, and negativity. It gets better. I once asked the Lord why so many people are confused, and he said to me, tell them to stop trying to figure everything out, and they will stop being confused. I found it to be absolutely true. Reasoning and confusion go together. <laughs> Weapons grade facepalm. And I have to resist the urge to inform Joyce Meyer that if she is preaching a literal Bible, that she is not qualified to instruct me in any way whatsoever. How does any woman champion a book that mutes their voice and decreases their value as compared to a man? How does this happen? Where do the Joyce Myers and the Beth Moores come from? They're wearing God glasses or they're filling their pockets. Ignorance often fueled by fear. An entire generation of religious young people in this country trained, programmed to fear evil like this man. <laughs> I mean, look at that face. Can you not sense the evil? <laughs> he did a big think video in 2012, and he said, evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science and all of biology. It's like analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is just going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. Well, of course, Ken Ham had to weigh in. And he said, Bill Nye, who's really the humanist guy, is out to get kids and brainwash them into secularism and atheism. We need to do all we can to capture these kids for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ken Ham accusing Bill Nye of brainwashing children. Boggles the mind. But you want to know how deeply embedded the fear of non-belief is in our culture? In subtle ways that many people won't pick up on. If you go to dictionary.com, one of the most popular online dictionaries in the world, and you type in the word godless, the definitions include wicked and evil. That's why we have to look up. We want to make sure that we're not infected by the evil. Don't listen to reason. Whatever you do, don't look too closely at the evidence. It's all in the Bible. I agree with Dawkins. I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Look, that type of ignorance is the reason you and I continue to have to tell people that the Shroud of Turin is not proof that Jesus Christ walked the earth 2,000 years ago and was crucified. This thing was dated to what? The medieval era? Replicated using ovens? By the way, I saw this handy uh, bedroom accessory. <laughs> 
Wouldn't you like to put that in the guest room and have somebody over? Tonight you'll be spending the evening in the arms of Jesus. Sleep well. It's the reason we continue to have to tell people that the Grand Canyon wasn't created 4,000 years ago in a global water event for which there is no geological evidence. It's the reason we have to continue to tell them that the Founding Fathers weren't necessarily Christian, and they certainly didn't set up a Christian nation. It's the reason we have to see pictures like this and inform them that this is not an ark, this is a formation of dirt formed by water. It's the reason that schools like this one in, ba I believe it's Baton Rouge, it's in Louisiana. It's a private Christian school in their science textbooks in the ninth grade are teaching proof of coexistence between dinosaurs and humans, right? Like the Garden of Eden and dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Here's proof, the Loch Ness Monster is real. Spotted by small submarine, most likely a plesiosaur. And they're teaching it as fact to young children. It's the reason you and I have to endure photographs on social media pages like this one. <laughs> How can you look at that and not know we're not all under the hands of Jesus, an almighty painter and creator up there? Here's the original photograph on Snopes.com, by the way. It's the same reason people accept blindly that God helps Tim Tebow throw touchdowns, but 14,000 children will starve to death today, and that makes sense. It's the same reason that... <sighs> the same reason we have to continue to hear that carbon dating doesn't work. Of course it works. I mean, look, there's carbon dating right there. <laughs> I will spare you the carbon copulation slide. I was going to stick in here next. Of course it works. If used correctly, I did a great podcast with evolutionary biologist Dr. Jerry Coyne, and he did, he did a primer on basic evolution that should be mandatory listening, I think, for everybody. I just sat back and let him go. The guy's freaking genius, and he's so good at educating about what evolution is and what it isn't answering many of the questions that you and I field every day. It's the same thinking that we're dealing with out there, that God has hand-selected your soul mate, the person you are designated to spend this life and all of eternity with, and his master plan for finding that person is to sign up at christianmingle.com. <laughs> Anybody remember the Procter & Gamble scandal? People here reluctant to give away their age, I totally understand. <laughs> well, for those who aren't familiar with it, back in the 80s, there was an urban legend, a rumor, that ran like wildfire in Christian church circles, that Procter and Gamble was giving portions of its profits to the Church of Satan and was essentially sort of a clandestine Satanist organization. And this was revealed on, supposedly, on the Donahue talk show. And people boycotted Procter & Gamble left and right. Whole churches dedicating sermons and services to it. There were petitions. There were so many phone calls to Procter & Gamble over this logo, which had 13 stars, so it must be evil, that they ended up changing their logo. Now... A basic search at a library, because the internet wasn't around back then, but just some basic question answering processes would have revealed that this was created by dock workers in a time when many people were not literate and used symbols to mark different crates. And the 13 stars represent the 13 colonies of the United States. Nothing satanic about it. But the panic was real. Ignorance fueled by fear. And there are people to this day who refuse to buy any product made by Procter & Gamble just in case. Stephen Prothero wrote a book called Religious Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't, which deals with ignorance not just about science and the rest of the world, but about our own Bible. 
How much did I really know about the scriptures when I was championing the scriptures as absolutely true? Well, he wrote this book, and it was a fascinating study that surveyed like a thousand people, believer and non-believer alike. Let's just find out what America knows about its own Bible. And the results were startling. 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. These are supposedly the most important rules ever handed down to humankind. Now, people can remember all the lyrics to their favorite songs on the radio, right? They can remember lists of all sorts of sort of superfluous stuff. But the most important rules ever given by God to humankind, you're lucky if you get half. One third of Americans couldn't tell you who gave the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> One third. Seventy-five percent of people polled believe that the sentence, God helps those who help themselves, is written in the pages of the Bible. It appears nowhere in Scripture. Fifty percent of high school seniors think Sodom and Gomorrah are married. <laughs> Ten percent of people surveyed believe that Noah's wife is Joan of Arc. <laughs> it makes you fear for the species, doesn't it? Aaron Ra is a buddy of mine. Any of you guys know Aaron and his work? Uh, I saw him at the. Uh, yeah, give the guy a round of applause. We put together a, a three-city tour, uh, him, myself, and Matt Delahunty, and we sort of tongue-in-cheek titled it the Unholy Trinity Tour. We go out and we speak, and I just saw him recently, and, and I'd seen him at another event in um, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. It was called Reason in the Rock, and he said something from the stage that was so good. When he was done, I grabbed him, and I said, I'm stealing this. I'm going to give you credit, but I'm stealing this and I'm taking it on the road. And he said this, ignorance is not just what you don't know, it's also what you won't know. This is just a little digression real fast, but anybody remember those radio hosts down in Florida who did the April Fool's joke? Where they went on the air, Val and Scott in the morning said, oh my God, there's dihydrogen monoxide in the water. And the entire region panicked. People are calling the Corps of Engineers. They're calling the radio station. They're pulling their children out of school. They're, it's pandemonium. Jesus Christ, there's dihydrogen. By the way, dihydrogen monoxide is water. So as a joke, they were telling people there's water in your water supply. And I think these guys actually got suspended for doing the gag. They were punished for the ignorance of the listenership. And this is normal in the United States of America. Now, far be it from me to stoop so low as to shill for my personal book or product line while I'm here in San Diego, <laughs> California. I think it's low and classless to do such a thing, and I would never stoop to that depth here. I, I, actually, I will. Yeah, thank you. I do appreciate the support. Uh, I, I, the book table is what I have in lieu of an honorarium, and uh, it helps to support my work, and I'm greatly greatly appreciative of that. But I bring the book up for this reason. I wanted to share an anecdote with you. Many of you know what it's like to come out of a religious family and you're pawed at all the time. Does anyone know what that's like? You're a pet project, right? You're broken. I will fix you. It's not enough. I will pray for you. It's I will fix you. And uh, I went through a very long period of time where my relationship with my mother and father was really on the ropes. And even now, there's an uneasy peace. It's difficult, but it's better. But we were at a point where I couldn't have a parent-child relationship because every conversation became an indictment of the fact that I rejected the worldview. I mean, they'd spent thousands of dollars. Mom took a job just to put us all in private Christian school to make sure that we would be raised up, trained up a child to be part of the straight and narrow, to be part of God. They see my apostasy as their failure as a mother and father, and it kills them. My father believes in a literal hell. He worships the guy who will send me to eternal torment. Go figure. I can't figure that out. 
And so he must fix me. And it becomes this thing where every time you get together, it's, oh, Seth, we, you, you have got to stop. You know, Jesus loves you so much, you know, that type of thing. So we uh, got together for a lunch date a while back. And I'm hoping it's going to be just, let's talk about small talk. Let's talk about the weather. Let's talk about, hey, have you been out on the boat lately? Um, how's retirement treating you? That kind of stuff. And we went and we had lunch and we had a ball. It was really nice, really nice. And we got to the end and we walked out and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Hey, this may be maybe the first sign that they are going to respect boundaries and allow their adult son to live his worldview without being pawed at like a science fair project. And mom looked at me and she goes, hey, come over here to the car. I got something I want to give you. Shit. <laughs> All right. So I walk over to the car and she pulls out this book. It's The Dawkins Delusion by Alistair McGrath. So I took the book and I said, all right, fine, I'm game. I'll bite. What's his angle? What's, what's he say in the book? And she said, well, I haven't actually read the book. <laughs> but this is really going to help you. <laughs> it was enough that Dawkins' name was in the title. And Daw Dawkins is supposedly the Pied Piper of atheism, right? To the outsider, they think we're all lemmings following Richard Dawkins over the cliff. And I'm like, you have no idea how much you have betrayed your ignorance about the free thought movement, right? Even those of us who have admired Dawkins' work, and I have, have points where we say, no, I disagree with that. I disagree with this. I disagree with this. I don't care for that. We're not sheep following this guy over the cliff. We may admire and respect his work and be grateful for his work. His work was instrumental in my own apostasy. The idea that we're just lining up like you would line up behind a spiritual shepherd is just crap. There is a, um, a syndrome that happens in religious cultures often that I find to be very alarming. And I did a radio interview with the guy who was my Christian radio boss. I don't suppose any of you heard that exchange, did you? I'm very sorry. It was a very long and kind of an arduous show, and I get it. Uh, I, I've had much better shows, probably much more compelling shows. But he called and he said, hey, I had no idea that you were this atheist activist. I'd like to come on your radio show. I've got a perspective on God I don't think your listeners have ever heard before. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> but as a good scientist, fine. All right, bring the goods. I said, it's not just a, it's not a religion, it's a relationship thing. Is it, oh, no, no, this is much deeper. I brought him on the air, and you know what it was? It's not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, he said something during the podcast I thought was very revealing. Listen to his words from that show of last summer. Here's my belief. Hey, you know, you are what you are at your worst moment. You can't judge me at, at, at what I am at my best. Because my true condition is always going to be what I am at my worst. And here's what I am at my worst. I'm arrogant. I'm unbecoming. I'm unlovable. I'm self-centered. I'm greedy. I'm all the very things that I don't want to be. But yet, here's the deal. I get up every day and I look at myself in the mirror and I go, I don't have any, I've got the desire to be different, but I don't have any power. Now, this is common teaching in the church. He actually got this from a gentleman named Mike Wells, who used to do a conference called the Abiding Life Conference. And the idea is, is that you don't know what I'm like on my birthday, when I'm in rare form and feeling good. You don't know what it's like when I've been voted person of the year or something, right? You know what I'm like when I've been cut off in traffic and I flip somebody off and I'm cussing them out. You know what I'm like in my worst moments, in my most unpleasant, my most ugly of moments. Those are the moments that define me. And I could change them if I could, but I don't have any power. Well, what does that sound like to you? To me, it sounds like a battered partner syndrome. The Bible will tell you in Romans, as it is written, there's no one righteous not even one. Now think about this in that context. Yahweh as opposed to someone who is heading up 
kind of a batter partner relationship. He's inaccessible and vague. He's jealous, and in fact, the scriptures will tell you he's a jealous God and has a temper. He blames us for everything. It's our fault. He tells us we're not good enough. You're not worthy. He threatens violence for noncompliance. He says we'll never survive without him, and yet we just can't leave him. The battered bride of Christ. I did a video a while back called Intelligent Design. Has anyone ever spoken to someone who's all wispy and misty-eyed, and they say, how can someone look at a beautiful San Diego sunset and not know that there isn't a divine painter in the sky who made this happen? How can you look at a mountain vista or the birth of a beautiful child and not know that there's a high? How can you look at the complexity of this world and not know that someone up there is in control, right? So I said, fine. If we're going to give God credit for design, let's give him credit for design. And the video runs about six minutes, and it deals with some of the stuff you often don't hear about from Sunday pulpit, which is tsunamis that kill a quarter of a million people in a single day, birth defects, tornadoes, and the AIDS virus, and insects that drill their way into the skulls of a live host to lay their eggs so that the larvae can eat it their way out while the host is still alive. Carnivorous animals tearing each other to, uh, to ribbons. Crib death. All the stuff that we don't see on God's resume. Well, that's what that video is about. Well, there's a guy named Foz Rana. He runs a website called Reasons to Believe, and he did a response video to my video. Now, I won't show you the whole thing. You can find it online if you'd like. But listen, now this guy's got a PhD in biochemistry and somehow believes the Bible. Listen to his explanation for what I call poor design in nature. If you want life on a planet, you have to have tectonic activity. No tectonic activity, no life. To have a planet without earthquakes would be to have a planet without life. And it's important to note along these lines that a recent study done by two engineers published in Nature demonstrates that over 83% of the deaths that result from earthquakes in the last three decades has been directly attributable to government corruption. That is, it is due to moral failing on the part of humanity, not, uh, not due to the nature of the world that we live in. So... The earthquake which caused the Indian Ocean tsunami that killed 240-some thousand people was probably our fault. How do we get there? How do we become that kind of battered partner? It's my fault. It went wrong. I'm not worthy. God got a sweet deal. He gets all the credit for the amazing stuff, and he totally gets a pass on everything else. And people accept this and say, well, I get my value from him. I'm reminded of the famous quote that says, birds born in a cage think flying is an illness. I'm an Oklahoma boy. Last year, on May the 20th, we saw an EF5 twister blow through the town of Moore, Oklahoma. Now, I just put a shelter in my house after last year's series of twisters. It's funny, I was driving home from an Arkansas date and this was like a week or two before or after this round of twisters. And I remember there were, there was severe weather and I was driving home and I was probably 30 minutes from the house. And I had Natalie on the phone. She had the radar up. She's giving me the play by play. What's going on? Where is it? Where are the sirens going off? And they, she said, there's rotation at 101st right next to Northeastern State University. While I was on the, the Creek Turnpike driving home, I was five miles driving toward Northeastern State University. And there was horizontal rain and no visibility I couldn't see. And at any moment, I thought, Jesus, this is going to be a freaking twister. And so we put a shelter in this year for that because we've had just such a, a tough, tough time. But Oklahoma is a very religious state. And so instead of questioning this design, most Oklahomans just run home to mama, right? They run right to God and say, oh, God, thank you that more weren't killed. Thank you that more damage wasn't done. Well, here's more Oklahoma. They've been hit three times in the last 15 years. The whole city's just gotten its ass kicked. Here's the damage path, 1999 compared to 2013. Look how eerily similar they are. 
Horrible stories like a woman driving with her infant child in her arms. Her family's in another vehicle behind her. They're trying to escape the twister. They're trying to get out of the way, and she didn't get there. The driver's side window smashes out. She and the infant child are sucked out and killed. Here's the vehicle. This is Moore Medical Center, a community devastated. And then you go to websites like the Christian Post that say, Bible found in OK Tornado Debris, open to Isaiah 32.2, providing hope for many. And even the Washington Post followed suit. Bible pages seen as sign of hope in storm. Now look, I'm not trying to trod upon the lives and the grief of the grieving. But somebody's got to say it. I understand we build the mechanisms for coping, but they are made by us. And here's probably one of the most devastating examples. This is Plaza Towers Elementary School. I was watching on live television. We actually grabbed the laptop and poured it in Channel 9 through the TV and watched it happen. EF5 Twister with 200 plus mile an hour winds plowed directly into the elementary school at the very end of a school day. The children hiding, cowering in a, in a uh, basement. There's no shelter in the school. Seven of the children horribly drown. But guy named Danny Moody goes on Twitter and he says, this landed on my truck in the midst of a chaotic tornado. My God still delivers. Now we have to examine this honestly. Even if it makes us uncomfortable, we have to examine it honestly. The implication is, is that God ignored the screams of precious children to save a few pieces of paper. And all around Oklahoma and even in the nation, people begin to say, God bless more. God bless us. God bless more. Pray for Oklahoma. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried out to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry reached his ears. Really? Our own governor went on national television. You know what she asked for? Prayers. The hashtag pray for Oklahoma went viral, became one of the most forwarded and used hashtags on the Internet, used even by our own president. Our prayers are with the people of Oklahoma today. Hashtag pray for Oklahoma. Celebrities like Beyonce, Rihanna, Katy Perry, Carrie Underwood and Alicia Keys sent prayers to Oklahoma. Ricky Gervais said, I feel like an idiot now. I only sent money. <laughs> Now watch this. He put the hashtag, actually do something for Oklahoma. <laughs> and he suggested that his 4.6 million followers each give $10 to the American Red Cross. It's beautiful. Well, we were trained in the church to see this stuff happen. And we looked up and said, for our lights and momentary affliction is achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Pain in this life, but bliss in the next. Essentially, we're going to live for dying. And no matter what happens to us, it's all part of the plan. Ignorance driven by fear, often by fear. And here's another great example from that very radio show I did with my former boss. He said on the radio that he believed that I, host of the thinkingatheist.com website, secretly still believed in God and was having internal conflict over it. And here's what he said. Okay, this is what I want you to do. This is, this is, this is how you can prove this to me, okay? Because I think you do. I think you do, and I think you have some doubts about it, and here's how you can undeniably prove it to me. I, I, I got on your website, um, before, you know, before we we got on earlier today, and I think you got. Are you going to Colorado? Yeah, I'll be there on Saturday. For uh, okay, here's what I want you to do on Saturday. How many people will be there? Two hundred. What do you think? Two hundred. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get down on your knees, and I want you to invite Satan to come into your life. 
That's what I want. I want you to. Do. I want you to go. You know what, Satan? If you're out there, you know I don't. I don't even know if you're out there. But I want. There's nothing that I want more than you. If you exist, I want you to come into my life, and I want you to have every part of me. All right. <laughs> Now, those of you with phone cameras are probably want to get them ready because there's a spot coming up that people love to put on Twitter and Facebook. There, there's a problem here, is that it would be dishonest for me to say, Satan, I want you to be the Lord of my life, because it would not be true. There's one person who guides and directs my decision-making process and accepts the rewards and consequences that come from those decisions, and that person is me. And folks, I don't know about you, but my days of bowing down are over. Over, right? But as sort of a wannabe scientist, I believe in being thorough. So I fashioned sort of a kind of an invitation to the Dark Lord, and I would like all of you to bear witness tonight. I always love this part of the speech. You can hear a pin drop out there, you know. <laughs> Dear Satan, I am the Lord of my own life. I don't believe in devils, demons, or hell. In fact, I feel a bit ridiculous talking to a character I find as real and threatening as Lord Voldemort. <laughs> but as a proponent of science, I believe in being thorough. So if you exist in this host of witnesses, I offer myself as a vessel for you to prove your power. Enter my heart, my body, my soul, or whatever's necessary for proper and unambiguous manifestation. And may my own eternal damnation provide the opportunity for the rescue of others. I've had people get genuinely freaked out by this part of my speech which tells you how deep-seated this type of programming goes. Look, Satan is the monster in the closet, and you and I aren't kids anymore. Satan and hell and those types of things that all the fear pimps toss at us left and right, that's, that, those are instruments of control designed to keep us from being curious to keep us from asking questions, to keep us from living our own lives, to keep us on their straight and narrow. It took me a while, it took me even a year and maybe a year and a half after I said the word atheist to finally get free of those eerie feelings and the goosebumps and the shudders when I thought about the idea of speaking to Satan, giving him any quarter in my life. Of course there's no Satan. And I'm not a kid anymore. Some folks got pissed off. I tacked this particular prayer with this. I said, hey, Satan, as long as you're coming, could you bring me a cherry cheese Danish and an espresso? <laughs> That's right, Satan. You served me. <laughs> Carl Sagan perhaps said it best. Avoidable human misery is more often caused not so much by stupidity as by ignorance, particularly our own ignorance about ourselves. We're afraid to ask the ultimate question. Well, what is the ultimate question? Well, my friends, I think that that question is different for every person. I think it is the question that you ask in your own life that sets you free. The question that gives you permission to ask all the other questions. The question that changes your world because you finally got there and said it out loud. And that question is different for every person, but it is, in my opinion, the ultimate question because it sets in motion this amazing chain that really tempers the rest of your life. The ultimate question is ask without or in spite of fear. It's more interested in facts than comfort. 
It's designed for knowledge over belief. It includes the whole of humanity and not segregated portions of it. It won't allow the answer to be a cheat. It's not afraid to hear we don't know yet. It's asking a voice that's prepared to speak alone against a roaring mob or a deafening silence. And it represents curiosity, passionate curiosity, defiant curiosity about the things that we are told we're not supposed to know. Whatever they tell us we shouldn't be asking about, we should really be asking about that. Whatever they say is forbidden fruit, forbidden to know, we should definitely know that. Whatever they say is restricted and off limits and sacred, we definitely challenge that first if possible. And our lives become greater because we've gained the courage to see the world and the universe as it is. And we continue every day to ask the ultimate question. Well, I normally would not finish a speech by reading something, but I was on the plane to uh, Colorado last summer and I just, people often ask me what my role is in the free thought community. And look, I know, I, I know me. I look at my face in the mirror every day and I, 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 I get the opportunity to meet genius level scientists and I think I'm at the kiddie table, right? I get the chance to meet brilliant philosophers and, and you know, ex-theologians and, and, you know, I had Robert M. Price on the air the other day and mentioned Dr. Jerry Coyne, all these people, and I think to myself, you know, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not any of those people. Valerie Tirico had her on, freaking genius. But I do see my role as a communicator, a storyteller, which I think this movement needs. It needs people who can tell a story. But mostly it's that I want to be an encourager. I see people struggling with the same stuff that I did. They carry it with them and they deal with family and they deal with all the baggage. And their, their, their entire zip code seems to be against them and they feel isolated and alone. And I just want to encourage them. It's what the podcast is about. Let's learn some stuff. Let's laugh together and be encouraged. So I, I had this on my heart, if I can use some religious terminology there. I had this on my heart. And I was convicted in my spirit. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to just write this out. So I pulled my laptop out. Have you ever had one of those moments? Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you're a musician or, or painter or something where you just get in the zone. And an hour and a half passed, and I'd written this thing. And I thought, this is exactly the way I wanted to say it. And so I carry it with me from city to city. And in places where I know that people might be struggling with this, I want to share the letter. Now, it takes about six minutes to read it. But if you will indulge me, my friends, I'd like to sort of cap the, the speech tonight with these words. And I'd like to read them pretty much verbatim because I like the way I said them the first time, if that'd be all right. You learn a lot about people when you declare that you're not going to live your life their way. And many in this room know the consequences of doing something so shocking and controversial as to be an individual, a singular voice, an often inquisitive voice with its own tenor, its own style, its own song, and its own message. You and I live in a world where, where conformity is comfort, and we all know how comfortable people can become. So many voices out there today are just an echo of previous voices, a hand-me-down from a previous generation, and the generation before, and the generation before. Breaking that cycle to them is unthinkable. And why would they ever consider it, as the cloak they've inherited feels so safe and warm? Everyone around them looks like them, walks like them, talks like them. Everyone except for you. They nod in agreement. You raise an eyebrow of doubt. They just know the answer. You just know the answer raises a whole lot more questions. They take security in staying on the path. You want to go carve a path of your own. But this is not what was expected of you or many of you. They laid out the guidelines for a proper person to live, and they were going to make sure that you turned out right no matter what. Maybe this was a parent or some sort of a guardian a pastor, a mentor. So what happened to you? At this very moment, mothers and fathers carry embarrassment and shame that they failed as a parent because you left the straight and narrow. 
You were co-opted and corrupted because you rewrote the playbook in a language they consider to be foreign, shameful, confusing, and ugly. You had two choices in your life. You could keep the peace and you could line up with the others, or you could walk at your own pace in your own direction for your own reasons and accept the consequences and rewards that come with being your own person. And the fallout for many of you has been significant. I saw some people nodding earlier. We were talking about religious families. These days, when they look at you, they only see what they think you should have been, what you might have been, what you could have been if only you had lived your life their way. They speak the words of love, but just barely, just barely. And by lacing it with distance and disdain, they cheapen the word. In fact, when they look at you and they say, I love you, love you, you get that bitter taste in your mouth like you've just been schmoozed by a politician whose only real desire is to get you to change your vote? Yeah, they love you, but the full package, the 100% love, the unfiltered love, well, that's going to be kept on reserve until you straighten up, until you do it their way, until you start acting normal. Well, for just a second, my friends, let's look at normal, shall we? Normal is a husband and wife married per the Bible, in a church and under God, condemning non-heterosexuals for ignoring and even desecrating the lawful and ordained marital union that they now enjoy after two divorces. <laughs> it's a mother telling her daughter that sex is dirty, that her body is dirty and shameful, that sexual desire is lust, it's a sin. And that she is cursed by the fall of Eve in the garden, a byproduct of sin designed to gain her worth from a future husband who, according to God in the book of Genesis, will rule over her. It's a Sunday school teacher frightening a six-year-old with stories of the devil and a fiery hell. It's refusing to purchase a new car without first test driving 15 vehicles from six different car lots and checking the vehicle history and the payment book and the insurance and the safety record and Carfax and everything else, but accepting the Bible as absolute fact without even knowing who wrote the book of Genesis. It's a church communion ritual where men, women, and children get together to ritualistically eat flesh and drink blood. This was normal to me growing up. Y'all come out next Sunday's communion Sunday. Get your heart right. Bring the kids. We're going to eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood. What the fuck? <laughs> How was this normal? It was normal. And now you look at it through the looking glass the other way and you go, oh my God. How screwed up is that? It's thanking God for food grown and prepared by human hands. It's giving God the glory for providing the new home that came with a 30-year mortgage. It's praying for safety after you buckle your seatbelt, lock your doors, and load your handgun. It's Sunday school songs, it's a Bible on the nightstand, it's a check on the offering plate, an evangelist on the TV, a Jesus fish on your car, and a t-shirt that says, seven days without Jesus makes one weak. I believe this is a prison designed to look like a mansion, and you're not going to live like that. You've read the books, and you've seen the history, and learned the science, and realized the world is much grander than most people ever imagine. You finally found your own voice, and you're going to speak in it. You've had the epiphany that you don't owe it to the rest of the world to keep them happy. You owe it to you and your loved ones to create happiness. And even though wherever and whenever you can, you say the words and you take the actions that build bridges and soften the sharp edges and demonstrate a love for people and a desire for a better world, you are not a sheep to be led, an echo to be repeated, a cautionary tale, a bad example, a freak, a pervert, shameful, broken, ugly. You are not ugly. You're beautiful. You figure it out with so many billions, literally billions of other people have missed. 
that life's too precious to spend in somebody else's shadow. That by judging everyone and everything that's different, you only indict your own shallow heart. And you cheat yourself out of the amazing depth, breadth, color, culture, and humanity that's so much more wonderful than the tiny rooms people lock themselves into in the narrow tunnels they walk. That believing in things without evidence, faith is not a virtue. Faith is not a virtue. It's something to be pitied. That sexuality isn't shameful. It is something to be celebrated. That the condemnation of what is wrong, even when it is called sacred, is the obligation of any and every moral creature. That your hopes, dreams, desires, loves, pursuits, and passions belong to you and you alone that you've stepped out of the crowd to stand forward, to stand out, and to stand your ground. To know that even though you occupy a tiny speck, inside a tiny speck, inside this vast universe, and even though you don't believe your father is a divine king who can do magic, and that your name is written in the heavens and you'll one day die and inherit a mansion, you have discovered that your life is wonderful and amazing and so much more satisfying. It's a life where every day brings a new opportunity to ask the ultimate question. Now, is that kind of life easy? Probably not in San Diego. Is it popular? Probably not. But be encouraged, my friends. Because inside this 13.7 billion year old universe, there has never, ever been anyone exactly like you, and there never will be again. And you are simply living a unique life that reflects that fact. And while others laugh at you because you are different, you can laugh at them because they are all the same. Thank you very, very much for having me.